turn in your Bibles to the 11th chapter, the book of Ezekiel, as we continue our study through the Word. So you'll remember what a tragic chapter, chapter 10 was. We saw that the glory of the Lord began to depart from Jerusalem. You'll remember that Ezekiel was caught up in the spirit and and he was brought to the temple. And, and you'll remember how the Lord showed him the hearts of the leaders and the priests. You'll remember how he showed him the women that were weeping over Tammuz and, and how the abominable had been brought to, into the, the gate of the temple itself. And you'll remember how God was reasoning with Ezekiel and, and saying, how, they are forcing me to depart my people uh, by the abominations that they are doing here at the temple uh, are forcing me to leave. You will remember that the cherubim that held the, uh, the chariot that God rides in, that, uh, that Ezekiel sees the, uh, the cherubim underneath and and the glory of the Lord as it then departed from the tabernacle itself. And, and here in this 11th chapter, we are going to see the, the final departure now of the, the glory of the Lord from the nation of Israel. And, and how tragic that is. How glorious it was when David had built the temple or had Solomon to build the temple, set aside all of the resources, and, and Solomon builds that temple, and there at the dedication, the, the presence of God Almighty himself there dwells in Jerusalem. And, and can you imagine, can you imagine if, you know, in Washington, D.C., rather than a president, we had God, you know, dwelling uh, there. You know, we had this, you know, we have this temple there and, and, there's, a, and there's God. And, you know, and you're the country, you're the people that have God residing, taking up residence in your nation. How, how absolutely amazing. And, you know, and, and then the way through his mighty hand, he planted them into the land and, you know, and he protected them and he said that, you know, that this is your land. I have given you the land. Uh, but what they had forgotten is God said that if you enter into idolatry, then I will remove you from the land. So it was a conditional promise to them uh, based upon their staying faithful to the Lord. And, and you remember how absolutely unfaithful they became and, and how wicked the idolatry came. And God warned them. He sent them prophet after prophet after prophet telling them that this isn't acceptable and to turn your hearts back and towards and, and the people were saying God doesn't see he doesn't hear we're allowed to do what we want to do in secret see here's the thing it's not that they had stopped coming to the temple it was that they were going to the temple plus the dabbling into everything else and I find that that is such a great warning for us as Christians uh, as well that you know we can be coming to in church we can be worshiping we can be doing our our devotions we can be doing everything right uh, but then we start to add on to it things that aren't right we start to compromise on the fringe and and get comfortable with that why because god knows my heart I, i'm there worshiping i'm there you know doing all of all of the the christian activities and and so we see that you know god warned them and and told them to to stop and then finally he gets to the point where now he is going to bring judgment upon the Jerusalem. And you remember that Ezekiel is there in Babylon. He's part of the, uh, the initial waves of, of captivity. And so he's ministering in uh, Babylon. While Jeremiah, his contemporary, he's in Jerusalem uh, itself. And so uh, we see that the, the, those that were in Jerusalem. Now, you would think, right? You would think that after the Babylonians come and take a portion of their nation away into captivity, not all of them, 
but some of them. You would think that would be the wake-up call that would then say, oh my gosh, God, we are, we are so sorry. You took you know, the whole East Coast to the Mississippi you know, into captivity, and, you know, and, and so we get it. But the exact opposite. You know what they said? Wow, the part that you took in the captivity didn't have the temple. And so we've got the temple and we've got his presence. So it will never happen to us and we can continue to, to, to live whatever way we want. And so even though God was speaking to them, they didn't want to hear what God had to say because they wanted what they wanted. They, they, wanted, to, they wanted to live in the flesh but then believe that they're spiritual at the same time. And, and we see that you, know, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot feed the flesh and live a life after the flesh and, and live after God at the same time. And, and so they were just fooling themselves. They, they looked like they were godly, but in fact, when God showed Ezekiel the hearts uh, of what was inside of, uh, of these people, these men, of these leaders, and how absolutely polluted you know, an, an abomination that their, that their heart was on, on the inside. It's interesting that Jesus really talked about the same thing with the, the Sermon on the Mount, the way in, in which the, the religious Pharisees and scribes of that day, they, they were looking at the externals, but, uh, but the internals were completely far from God. And, and we see that, you know, Jesus was talking about the fact that, that God wants a relationship with you. He wants your heart towards him. He wants a real uh, relationship. And, and so part of a real relationship is trust. It's faithfulness. It's honesty, it's transparency, it's, it's all of these things. Well, they had just had a relationship with rules and regulations and, and not with God. So here we see that the nation now uh, earlier has fallen into that mm, trap of believing that because they have the trappings and they have the outward manifestation of God, that they now were holy by proximity to the temple. Uh, and we see that, that God is now departing from the nation. And, and so the chariot rises up from the tabernacle and, and then it moves to the threshold. It moves towards the, the eastern gate and, and interesting, it's going to head out over the, the Mount of Olives. And, and that's where the glory of the Lord departs. It's interesting that it is in the Mount of Olives right there outside of the east gate. That, that is where Jesus made his triumphal entry through that in East Gate. And Jesus uh, also ascended into heaven off of the Mount of Olives right there, uh, departed God incarnate uh, from the Mount of Olives, departed. And Jesus Christ is going to return and touch down right there on the Mount of Olives and make his way back in through the, uh, the Eastern Gate. And, uh, and so uh, here we see the, uh, the departure now of the, uh, of the glory of uh, the Lord. We begin in verse 1 of this 11th chapter, and it says, Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the East Gate of the Lord's house, which faces eastward. And there at the door of the gate were 25 men, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azer, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaniah, and princes of the people. And, and so we see at the gate here, the eastern gate, this is now where these 25 men were. They're not the same 25. You'll remember that we're worshiping the, uh, the sun. Uh, this is a different uh, group of uh, 25 and uh, not exactly sure about these, uh, these uh, men that, uh, that Ezekiel points out. But in verse 2 it says, and he said to me, son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity. And give wicked counsel in this city, who say, the time is not near to build uh, houses. This city is a cauldron, and uh, we are the meat. And so and here we see that, uh, that these men, listen to what God says. He says that they devise uh, iniquity. They, they think about evil. 
They, they lay on their beds and, and they are scheming evil. And, and so they are devising it. And, and not only are they devising iniquity, but also it says that they then are giving wicked counsel in the city. A little leaven leavens the entire lump. And so here you have the, the wickedness. You have those that are devising iniquity. And then what do they do? They spread it. They take the, their counsel now and they spread it to others. And, and yet these are the very ones that are supposed to be the, the leaders. They have been given the responsibility, listen, of leading God's people. Now that's a big responsibility, and, uh, and yet there was no fear of God now any longer. And, and so uh, they were saying that the, the time is not near to build houses. This city is the cauldron, and, and we are the meat. And so uh, here we see that, uh, that they are saying that, uh, will it not soon be time to, uh, to build houses? The, uh, the city is a cooking pot, and we are the meat. The elders were encouraging those people that were living there in Jerusalem to forget the prophet's predictions of the coming Babylonian invasion. They were urging the people to, to build houses. It's going to be a time to build houses again. Now, meantime, you've got the Babylonian army, you know, that's about to invade them, that has, you know, besieged them already before and stuff. Uh, but uh, we see that there was hope. Uh, Jerusalem had hope. They were making a deal with Egypt, uh, that Egypt, who was also a, a big power, they formed an alliance that Egypt was going to come and rescue them. So rather than putting their trust in God, they put their trust in, uh, in man. Now, something else that's interesting, Egypt is always a type of the world. And so here we see this is a picture of God's people turning to the world to, to try and now gain rescue instead of uh, turning to God. And of course it doesn't work. And uh, the Egyptians, they... Uh, withdraw and retreat and then the Babylonians just crush the, uh, the, 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 the Jews and, and demolish Jerusalem. But these false people are saying, you know, these false prophets are saying, hey, don't worry about, you know, Babylon. Get back to putting that new addition onto your house and, you know, get the new 110-inch plasma screen and put that in. It's awesome now, you know, and don't, don't worry, you know, it's, and all. And so keep, keep on living in life keep and keep living your best life and and this is what the prophets were saying and and here we see that you know the true prophets you know jeremiah and all are saying weep mourn get your heart right with god uh, look at god is going to judge us and and so you have the two different uh, voices it, it, it is you know tragic when God's leaders are leading people into the world and away from God. That is always tragic. And, uh, and so here, verse 4, it says, Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. And then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said, Speak. Thus says the Lord. Thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I, I know the things that come into uh, your mind. We see here that God tells Ezekiel to prophesy against them. He says, they're prophesying hope. They're prophesying, build your houses and everything's going to be fine and everything will work out. Okay, but here God is saying, but I know what's really in your heart. And you know in your heart judgment is coming. There is great fear. And that is the truth of what is in your heart. But what are you saying with your lips? Oh, nothing is going to happen. So when God calls out the hypocrisy, he says, for I know the things that come into your mind. That's a scary thought. The things that come into our mind. That God knows all of the thoughts that, uh, that we have. And, and what's interesting uh, is that God knows, listen, what we do with those thoughts. You see, the enemy can put a thought into your mind. No, know this, the enemy doesn't know what's going on inside of your mind. Only God knows your thoughts. But what the enemy can do is he can put a thought into mm, your mind. And then, uh, just like a fish with bait, 
sees if you start taking that and bait and, and now if, if this picture that he has to recall for you or this scene or, or this experience that you had in your life and whether or not you will take that and scene and start to replay it again. And he's like, pull up some, some, some chair here. Here's some popcorn and, you know, and, and let yourself go. And, you know, and, and no one sees what's going on in your mind whatsoever. But you know what? God says, I see what's going on in your mind. Now, I want you to know that when the enemy puts that thought into your head, that thought is not sin. But it says that we're to take every thought, what? We'll take it every single thought captive and say, no, not going there. And then you usher it out. And so that is the overcoming of the temptation. And the Bible says that, that no temptation overcomes you, but such as is common to man. We're all tempted. He's always shooting fiery darts into, you know, into our uh, minds. And we're not going to be able to stop him from shooting those fiery darts. But we're to capture that fiery dart and extinguish it uh, right away versus... You know, uh, before we were saved, the enemy would shoot a fiery dart in. Man, we'd have a bonfire, you know, and, and all. and Think nothing of it, you know. But, uh, but it, it's important that, that we are cognizant of our thought life. Because, listen, God's watching your thought life. And God's watching my thought life. And so it, it gives room for us to, to pause with... Uh, with that mm, awareness. He, he says in verse 6, You have multiplied your slain in this city, and you have filled its streets with the slain. And therefore, thus says the Lord God, Your slain whom you have laid in its midst, they are the meat. And, and this city is the mm, cauldron. Uh, see, when, before he's talking about the meat in the cauldron, uh, the meat is protected, it's safe in the protection of the pot and the, of the and cauldron. So the people in Jerusalem, the residents are saying, look, at, we're safe, you know, we're the meat and we are safe uh, in this uh, cauldron. And, and God is going to say, yeah, uh, the city is in fact a, a cauldron, but you are not the meat. The slain, the righteous that you have put to death, the ones that you have persecuted, they are the meat that was in the cauldron there uh, of the city. And so uh, he says, those, those you have laid in its midst, they are the meat. And this city is the cauldron, but I shall bring you out of the midst uh, of it. You have feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, says the Lord God. And I will bring you out of its midst. So here he's talking about bringing them into captivity. They think that they're safe inside of the, uh, the walled city. He says, I am going to bring you out uh, of uh, this uh, city. I will bring you out of its midst and deliver you into the hands of strangers and execute judgments on you, and you shall fall by the sword. And I will judge you at the border of Israel. And then... You shall know that I am the uh, Lord. And in verse 11, this city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in, in its midst. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, nor executed my judgments, but have done according to the customs of the Gentiles, which are all around you. And, uh, and so, you know, you, you remember how Moses gave them the law. And, and the law taught them what's clean and unclean. And so this is the way that you are to live, not like the Gentiles. And, and so here they are in the land. God's blessed them. They, they have prospered. And what do they do? They now start adding in the ways of the Gentiles into their lives. And, um, and so they were polluting themselves. God says, you know, be holy, be separate, come out from among them. You're my people. Don't live like you're not my people. And, and yet uh, here they are now living like they're not uh, God's people, but yet living living and acting and calling themselves uh, as if they were God's people because they had the temple and they would still eat kosher food and, uh, and these things here that made them feel like they were God's people. But their heart was unfaithful. And so here we see that uh, God is telling them that they are going after the customs of the uh, Gentiles. He says, now it happened, verse 13, while I was prophesying that Pelatiah, the son of Benaniah, died. And then I fell on my face and cried with a loud voice and said, ah, 
Lord God, will you make a complete end of the remnant of, the, of Israel? And so uh, Pelatiah was a, a, a righteous man, devout um, towards God, and he dies. And, and Ezekiel now is just like, you know, there's so few of us left uh, that are truly worshiping you, God. And, and so, oh, how the, the mighty have fallen, how, how sad it is when you lose, you know, uh, someone who has been so influential and so and strong, you know, in the, uh, in the faith. I remember when Pastor Chuck died and just, you know, how sad it was that, you know, we don't have Pastor Chuck anymore, you know. It, it's like, you know, the situations uh, happen in our world and the news, what our country is going through. It's like, man, I wonder what Pastor Chuck would have said about this. You know, what, well, where would Pastor Chuck have, you know, have led in this? Well, uh, Pelatiah was one of those godly men, and Ezekiel, when he departs, he's like, you know, oh, Lord, you know, we, we, we've lost one of our uh, righteous men. And, and it says in verse 14, again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, son of man, your brethren, your relatives, your countrymen, and all the house of Israel in its entirety are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, get far away from the Lord. This land has been given to us uh, as a, a possession. Uh, and so uh, here we see that, uh, that, that what the Jews were saying in, uh, in Jerusalem is they were saying that they're the remnant. That, you know, those that have been taken into exile, they're the ones that are far away from God. But what was happening was that those that were taken away in Babylon, those that had, had lost their land, those that had lost access into the temple, the, their hearts were turning back and towards God. They were the ones that were uh, beginning to repent and to uh, recognize the chastisement of the Lord. And, and so what Ezekiel now is saying is that it's the, the remnant aren't the ones that are still in Jerusalem because the ones that are still in Jerusalem are still conducting themselves like Gentiles, are still mixing everything uh, up. They're still worshiping their abominations and, and all of this. But those that have paid the consequence of, uh, of exile, they're the ones that now that have become the, uh, the, the, the true remnant uh, here. And, uh, and so he says that the, the, those that are far away, he, he says they're far away from the Lord. And so here, what, what they didn't recognize is they, they, they localized God in, in terms of geography. They, they thought that God was you know, limited or restricted there to the temple and so proximity uh, to the temple. But uh, we see here that, uh, that, uh, that God... Uh, is omnipresent and heaven the earth is his footstool and heaven is his throne and all of creation can't contain God and therefore say verse 16 thus says the Lord although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles and although I have scattered them among the countries yet I shall be a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone and so we see that now God was declaring the accessibility uh, to faithful Jews uh, wherever they were um, geographically. And therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you from the countries from where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of the Israel. Uh, and so we see that once again, God is declaring that he's not done with the nation. What did he say? I have scattered you, but what will I do? I will go regather you again and I will bring you back in and I will establish you uh, in the nation there and I will give you the, uh, the land of uh, Israel uh, and they will go there and, and they will take away all its detestable things and all its abominations from there and then I will give them one heart 
and I will put a new spirit within them and, and take the stony heart out of their flesh and, and give them a, a heart of flesh. And so this regathering of the nation, we, we see that it happened after the Babylonian captivity. And you remember that they came back into the, uh, the land again and, and were established. After the destruction by the Romans, we see that in... Uh, the, the, the United Nations uh, proclamation that in 1948 that gave them back their land uh, uh, now and we saw the regathering uh, of the nation of Israel that's another partial fulfillment uh, of God talking about bringing them but the complete fulfillment is going to uh, happen uh, right before the millennial kingdom is set up when Christ returns and, and there is going to be a, a full regathering. When they see him whom they pierced and they will uh, weep uh, over him and, and God then uh, will put his spirit uh, upon them. Remember during the rapture of the church that there's going to be uh, the 144,000 witnesses that are going to have the, the spirit of God that is now going to uh, be upon them and they will be the remnant on the face of the earth once the uh, the church is raptured up and uh, and so um, here we see that uh, that he is declaring that uh, that he will gather them back and and they will then put away the detestable things they uh, they will wash away the uh, the abominations and and he says he's going to give them that new spirit and, and he's going to take away the the stony heart and give them a, a heart of, uh, of flesh and uh, and so uh, here we see that this now means the the inauguration of the new covenant and how the nation of Israel is going to finally enter in in mass to the uh, new covenant and uh, and so uh, this will happen at the uh, millennial reign. So that, verse 20, they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire for their detestable things and their abominations, he says, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, uh, says the Lord. Not only were God's people sinning, listen, they were enjoying their sin. They, they, they were relishing in their, uh, their uh, sin. And then uh, they would go to temple and offer a, a, a sacrifice there. But uh, he says that, uh, that I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, uh, says the Lord. And so the cherubim, verse 22, lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them and the glory of the Lord of Israel was high above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain which is on the east side of the city. It's now the, uh, over by the Mount of Olives. It, uh, it hovers up and and how tragic is now the, uh, the spirit of the Lord is departing. It says, then the spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the spirit of God into Chaldea, back to Babylon, uh, where he had been to those in captivity. And the vision that I had seen went up from me. So I spoke to those in captivity of all the things the Lord had shown me. So the vision started by him being transported to uh, the temple, to Jerusalem, and then uh, God showing him the different parts of the temple, the different things that were transpiring, and then uh, he is brought back again. And Ezekiel says, I shared everything uh, with the people that were there uh, in Chaldea. In verse 1 of chapter 12, now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which has eyes to see but does not see and ears to hear but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. Here, the spirit of rebellion. And how a spirit of rebellion, it just blinds you to the spiritual truth of the things that are uh, going on. And, you know, Satan is the one that, that leads all rebellion. When, when you have a rebellious in the spirit, I want you to know that, that that is the spirit not of your heavenly father, but, but that is the, the spirit now of Satan who led 
the first rebellion against God there in, in heaven. And so they have eyes. The people in Jerusalem have eyes, but they're, they're not seeing the truth that is around. They have ears. Prophets are telling them the truth, but uh, they're not listening. They're not hearing the truth of what uh, God is saying. It's not penetrating their, uh, their hearts, and that's because they have a, a rebellious heart. Therefore, verse 3, Son of man, prepare your belongings for captivity. And go into captivity by day in their sight. And you shall go from your place into captivity to another place in their sight. And it may be that they will consider, though they are a rebellious house. And by day you shall bring out your belongings in their sight, as though going into captivity. And at evening you shall go in their sight like those uh, who go into captivity. Dig through the wall in their sight and carry your belongings out and through it. In their sight you shall bear them on your shoulders and carry them out at twilight, and you shall cover your face so that you cannot see the ground, for I have made you a sign to the house of Israel. So I did as I was commanded. I brought out my belongings by day as though going into captivity, and at evening I dug through the wall with my hand, and, and I brought them out at twilight, and, and I bore them on my shoulder in their sight. So hey, here's what God tells Ezekiel. Ezekiel, during the daytime, I want you to go to your house and start taking your, your furniture out and bring it over next to the wall of the city and then go back and get the next item and go get the next item and go get the next item so that during the day they see you that you're moving uh, all of your stuff and you're moving your stuff to the wall. And then what I want you to do is I want you to uh, dig a hole uh, through the wall, under the wall there. And then by night, I want you to start taking your possessions out through that hole outside of the city. Remember how God uses Ezekiel to be these living demonstrations, you know, of the, uh, of the truth, of the truths that he is proclaiming, but that they won't listen to. So Ezekiel gets to act them out, you know, in these, uh, in these you know, illustrations. Uh, uh, and so uh, he is uh, doing this. And And it says, in in the morning, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, what are you doing? And say to them, thus says the Lord God, this burden concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are among them. Say, I am a sign to you. As I have done, so it shall be done to them. And they shall be carried away into captivity. And the prince who is among them shall bear his belongings on his shoulder at twilight and go out. And they shall dig through the wall to carry them out and through it. And he shall cover his face so that he cannot see the ground with his eyes. And I will also spread my net over him and he shall be caught in my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. And I will scatter to every wind all who are around him to help him and all his troops, and I will draw out the sword after them. So this is a prophecy here against Zedekiah. Zedekiah is the last king, and he's the king that is in Jerusalem. And here is what Ezekiel is acting out. Ezekiel is acting out when the Babylonians do surround them and lay siege to the city. Uh, Zedekiah is going to, in the middle of the night, he's going to take his family and he's going to take some troops and and they are going to go out through a secret crack uh, in the wall. He says the prince is going to carry his own stuff just like uh, Ezekiel had to carry his stuff through the, uh, through the hole under the wall. And he says that, uh, but uh, he says, I'm going to scatter his net and around him. He's, he's not going to get away. They make their way towards the, uh, the plains there in Jericho and the Babylonian troops, uh, they catch up with them. He says that Zedekiah, he says, I'm going to bring him to Babylon. He says, but he's never going to see it. When Nebuchadnezzar captures Zedekiah, who Nebuchadnezzar had put as the king, and so when he betrays Nebuchadnezzar now, 
uh, after Nebuchadnezzar had made him his vassal and king. We see that what Nebuchadnezzar did was uh, he took Zedekiah's family. Uh, and what he did is uh, in front of Zedekiah, um, he has them killed. So Zedekiah watches his own family and be killed. And then uh, what Nebuchadnezzar does is he puts his eyes out uh, so that the last things that his eyes ever saw was his own loved ones now uh, being put to death. And then uh, he is brought to Babylon where he lives the rest of his life there in captivity uh, blind. And so uh, here we see that God is telling Ezekiel to, uh, to model this out for them as, as they are saying, you know, let's build houses and everything's going to be uh, great again. And here we see Ezekiel is saying, let me tell you, What's coming? Let, let me tell you how tragic uh, that is what is um, befalling. And, uh, but again, uh, what did he do first? He had him to tour uh, Jerusalem and to see the abominations and the wickedness that, that even now they were still uh, involved in and that they would not uh, repent. Uh, and so then he says, verse 15, they shall know that I am the Lord when I scatter them among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. But I will spare a few of their men from the sword, from famine and from pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the Gentiles wherever they go. And then they shall know that uh, I am the Lord. There was a remnant that was uh, spared uh, here. And, uh, and so uh, now we see that uh, Ezekiel declares that. In the final portion of this chapter, uh, there, there, was the, uh, the, there was a saying uh, about how uh, the, that Ezekiel may be a true prophet. Uh, they believed that about Ezekiel, but they said that the things that Ezekiel is talking about, they're, they're like, you know, a hundred years from now. We're never going to see them in, in our lifetime. So that even though he might be saying uh, things that are true, there nothing we need to worry about. And gang, this is like next generation and, and generation after that. And so God now is going to tell them, no, I, I am about to act now. And so he is going to remove now that, uh, that saying. Moreover, the word of the Lord, verse 17, came to me saying, Son of man, eat your bread with quaking and drink your water with trembling and anxiety and say to the people of the land, thus says the Lord God, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with anxiety and drink their water with dread so that her land may be emptied of all who are in it because of the violence of all those who dwell in it. And then the cities that are inhabited shall be laid waste and the land shall become desolate and you shall know that I am the Lord. So hey, here they are, they're believing that they're safe, they're fine in Jerusalem, but uh, Ezekiel is to eat his bread trembling and drink his water with anxiety. And what he is portraying there is that when the Babylonians come and they will, and when they lay siege, everybody that is inside, uh, they are going to be eating uh, their food and water that they have uh, with great anxiety because the Babylonians are, are now encamped uh, around them. And then ultimately, he says, they're, gonna, they're going to leave your land desolate. When they depart, they are going to have decimated the, uh, the land. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, verse 21, son of man, what is this proverb that your people have about the land of Israel, which says, the days are prolonged and every vision fails. Uh, the days are prolonged. The, those visions are not for uh, right now. Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will lay this proverb to rest and they shall no more use it uh, as a proverb uh, in Israel. But say to them, the days are at hand and the fulfillment of every vision. For the, no more shall there be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I speak, and the word which I speak will come to pass. And it will be no more be postponed. For in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and perform it, says the Lord God. And so here we see that not only is he declaring it uh, through Ezekiel, he says, but in your days I'm saying it and I am going to do it in your days. This isn't for generations that are to come. This is for now. And again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, look, the house of Israel is saying, the vision that he sees is for many days from now, and he prophesies of times far off. 
And therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be postponed anymore, but the word which I speak will be done, says the Lord God. And so here we see that the first proverb really dealt with the, uh, the question mark of, uh, of the fact of God's judgment, but uh, we see that the second one deals with the, uh, the intimacy, the, the, the immediacy uh, of this judgment. And so here we see that God says that, uh, that he is going to keep a remnant, that he is going to bring them back, that he is not done with them, and that one day they will have a new heart that will be given to them. Not a heart of stone, but uh, a heart of um, flesh. And, and this speaks of them coming underneath the, the new covenant when he is going to pour his spirit out uh, upon them and that uh, they now uh, are going to experience God uh, in the new covenant. And, and tonight is our communion night. It is the night that we celebrate the very thing that Ezekiel is talking about as a, as a far-off event that is going to, uh, to take place. Well, uh, for us, it is the far-off event that has taken place. It hasn't taken place in the nation of, uh, of Israel as a, as a nation yet, but uh, the salvation has been offered, Romans explains, to each and every single person individually. So every single Jew is invited into this uh, new covenant until they will as a nation recognize and declare. Listen, one day the nation of Israel is going to declare that Jesus Christ is uh, the Messiah. The, the nation itself uh, is going to uh, proclaim that uh, one day. And, and for us in our own hearts, that, that day has already come. When, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal uh, Lord and Savior. When, when we entered into the new covenant and, and what Christ came and, and taught us that was unless our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees that, that we can't uh, enter in, that, that no person can earn their way in, into heaven and that Jesus Christ is that Lamb of God that came down from heaven, that we confessed our um, sin unto him and he went to the cross with our sin and paid the price for our sin. Think about every sin that you ever committed. And you know what? Jesus took all of your sin, every single one. He didn't leave one behind. He took every single one. And he who knew no sin at all became sin when he took our sin. In the same way, when Jesus, uh, who was never defiled, touches the leper and he takes the defilement of the leper upon himself, but what does he do? He, he gives wholeness to the leper uh, in exchange. And, and so Jesus then went and, and paid the most horrible of prices when he died, not just died, but when he was crucified. Probably the most intentional, painful way to execute somebody that had ever been devised. It was devised to be cruel and to be painful as a, as a warning. The Romans didn't invent it, it says, but they perfected it uh, as a way of saying, don't mess with Rome. And so when Christ took our sin and, and he went and he died, he died in the most painful of fashions, paying for your sin and for my sin. Again, another lesson to us of, of, of how treacherous sin is and how God does not look on sin lightly in any way, shape, or form. And, and at that last supper with his disciples, he said that I, I want you to gather together and I want you to come to the communion table and I just want you to remember. I just want you to be walking the face of the earth knowing this, you are loved. That I love you more than you will ever know and that you are gonna stand before me face to face uh, one day and you will feel my embrace and, and my love but right now I'm going to set you free from your sin so that you can live a life 
free from sin, from the bondage of sin and the bondage of death, so that you may worship the Father freely, that you may freely experience the fullness of his gifts and of his love, and that you can have that peace that passes all understanding that will guard your heart uh, and your mind. And so my peace I give to you, not the peace that the world experiences, but, but my peace. And so communion is a night to just stop and to say, thank you. I mean, how can you thank someone who literally gave you your eternal life that paid the purchase price for your entrance into heaven? I want to invite the worship team to come on up, and I want to invite the ushers to go ahead now and to pass out the elements. I'm going to have the lights be dimmed to uh, now, uh, and, and uh, we are going to go into just a time of reflection, and just a, a, a time now of uh, experiencing just you know the the love that Christ has for for each and every one of us, and you know, and uh, the Bible talks about not taking communion in an unworthy fashion, and what what does it mean to take communion in an unworthy fashion? An unworthy fashion is this. It, it means that you've got sin in your life and you know that you've got sin in your life, but you don't want to let go of that sin. That, that you are not making a commitment not to return back to that, that sin that, that you've got going in, in your life. And, and so to profess Jesus as Lord, but then to, to hold on to sin and to not surrender it, that, that's, that's not having Jesus as Lord of your life. And, and so that, that is that, Lord, search me and try my heart. And, you know, and God forgives every sin, but, uh, but he desires that we would bring that sin to him and, and to say, Lord, I, I am sorry. Romans tells us we all fall short. There's, there's sin that is in our life. It's not an issue of, of salvation. You remember how Jesus washed the, uh, the feet of the disciples, and when he comes to Peter, Peter says, man, give me a shower, then head to toe, just you know, uh, lay it on me. And, and Jesus says, no, you're already clean. But you know, just your feet, as we walk through daily, we, uh, we sin, we speak harsher than we wanted to, we fall short of, uh, uh, of loving the way that we, uh, that we could or that we should. And, uh, and so it's just those, you know, just those daily washings, those daily confessings and, uh, and all, and, and just a time of, of just being cleansed, you know, when, uh, when I bathe the, the boys when they were young and uh, they get out of the bathtub and you wrap a towel around them and man, they just, they, they smelled so good as compared to when they went into the bathtub uh, and, you know, and just that, you know, wrapping them up, having them on my uh, lap and the, there they are fresh and clean and just mm, amazing and, and, and that's the, you know, that's the picture, you know, when, when we come and we just confess our sins and we just get washed and clean and your dad just, your heavenly father just wraps you up in his arms and just tells you how amazing you are and how much you're loved and, and, and to experience his love tonight, to know that you're loved, to receive that love, and to live like you're loved and to also live knowing you are not alone that you are not alone. And so let's just spend a few minutes uh, here before the Lord with, with the elements, just thanking Him, confessing, just spending time in His presence, just connecting with, uh, with the Lord who loves you so, so very much. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says that he who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, but by whose stripes that you were healed. Traditionally, we use the 
matzah bread for our communion and and the matzah has these stripes that are uh, in it. We also uh, notice with the communion elements that there's no leaven in the bread and uh, and leaven is a typology of of sin as the bread is representative of his body. It's representative of his body that had been striped when he was scourged and and also that that there was no sin that he who knew no sin and and so at that last supper Jesus takes that bread and and he breaks it and I cannot help but to think that as that bread breaks he knows that that his own body is going to be broken as he carries that cross to Golgotha the hill on Calgary and and allows them to nail himself, nail him into that tree. The pain that he would suffer but it says that for the joy that was set before us that he endured that pain and, and we are that joy that was set before him that he looked through that pain and saw us set free washed cleansed robed in righteousness and gathered together as the bride of uh, of christ and he was willing to to suffer and die for you and it says no greater love is a man than this and he would lay down his life for a friend there's no way that you can show somebody that you love them there's no greater way than than if you through the giving of your life was able to give them life and so we are the recipients of the greatest act of love in the history of mankind for one reason that you might know you're loved you're loved you're crazy loved and that you would always know that and never doubt that It says that as they were eating, Jesus took bread, he blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body. Let's partake of the broken body of Christ. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Christ says, I'm not going to drink of the cup again until I drink it at the marriage supper of the Lamb with my bride in heaven. He says, until then, partake of this and look forward to that. Let's partake of the cup. Heavenly Father, what a glorious uh, day indeed that will be when... Uh, when Jesus Christ uh, comes and and raptures his church off the face of the earth and uh, and those who are with him they they will be joined first and then we who are alive will be changed in a moment in an instant and and we will gather together with him never to be separated uh, so Father, what glorious future you have for each and every one of us. And Jesus, uh, thank you for coming and, and dying. And Lord, we cannot wait to, to see you face to face and to see you rule and reign in righteousness uh, over this world. Even so, Lord, come quickly and all God's people said, Amen, Amen and Amen.